one move to the front because it's something I've been trying for the last couple of weeks and it just works a lot better because it's really weird having some people. Is my zipper down? Oh, okay. <laughs> so if I, if I could talk as many people into coming to the front, it's just a request. If you don't, rock on. You do you. All right, let's stand up and pray. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, in the name of one God, amen. Dear Lord, we thank you for this morning, Lord. We thank you for the opportunity that we may come and listen to your word, Lord. For your house is always open to us, Lord. And how much do we appreciate this house, Lord, for we had taken it, taken it for granted, Lord, in the last couple of years. But I thank you that we may come and unite here as your body. So I ask, Lord, that your spirit just fill this upper room right now, Lord, that these words that that they will penetrate our hearts, Lord, that we will receive meaning from them, Lord, that, we will, that they will be applicable to us, Lord. But more importantly than anything that I have to say, Lord, I ask that, that your Holy Spirit just work, that it wrestle with hearts. Lord, that these are not just words, Lord, but that you turn them into application into our life, Lord. I ask that you guide us all individually, Lord, to show us what we need to do, um, what you are, are asking from us, Lord, and how you will work. And I ask that you give me the gift of prophecy that I may deliver your word to your people. And I ask in such of ours, names from our tears, here's when we pray one voice saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Through Christ Jesus our Lord, if I was the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Okay, so I'm not going to ask you guys what series we're in because every single time I do that, it hurts my feelings because no one ever remembers. So I will just tell you right now that we're kind of, we've chosen this time of Lent that we're going to work through some of the miracles of Christ because I believe that it's very, very applicable for Lent. I think it's very applicable for what we're building up to, which is like the Feast of the Resurrection. And when I was actually even deciding which miracle we were going to cover today, um, a lot of the times I'll have like kind of like a miracle on my mind and then I'll, I'll kind of commit to the miracle and then I'll start working kind of through the story. And I will tell you um, that I had a couple aha moments when I was kind of working through this miracle because I think we're going to see a lot of redundancy in some of the past miracles that we've covered. Um, and, and I will tell you, so if you guys want to know where we're at, we're going we're gonna to spend a little bit of time in Luke 8 today. So I know everybody has a Bible questionable whether or not it has pages, but if nothing else, everyone will take out their, their cell phones. You can pull up the Bible app and you can kind of read through it with us. Um, and I'm going to tell you that this, this is one of those miracles where it's covered in three out of the four Gospels. Okay, so was it important enough for that? And the, the miracle we're going to be covering is when Christ raised Jairus' daughter. And I'm going to tell you um, one of the reasons I kind of want to talk about this one is if you guys remember... Luke 8 is where you also find the woman with the issue of blood. And as I shared, I think I covered this thing like maybe three or four weeks ago before we started this series, just as one of my favorite Bible stories. Um, and then ironically, Mark also like, you know, I told him, hey, we're going to do a series on miracles. And which one did he choose? This one, uh, the woman or he chose the woman with the issue of blood. Um, and he covered that last week. And, and because of my love for that miracle so much, a lot of the times I totally overlook this miracle because this is the miracle that is kind of like it starts before the woman of the issue of blood and it ends after the woman uh, with the issues of blood. But I think one of the things we need to remember that whenever there's a, like someone coming back from the dead in the Bible, like that's a big deal. Like when you look at all of the miracles that like Christ performed, like some of the biggest deals is when he brought people back from the dead, like when there's resurrection. And we also know that, especially when it comes to Christ, his mission, you know, his plan, salvation, like it all came down to resurrection, like bringing dead things back to life. Do you have a question? Yeah, was it obvious? I mean, obviously with Lazarus, mm -hmm. it was obvious that he was dead dead. Mm -hmm. But was it obvious to the people at the time that these other people had died or were they just ill and... Well, we're going to actually, I'll tell you, so there's one of, I, I wish I was there to see how it was received, you know, but you know that there was one where there was a widow who had her son dead and it was in a procession, right? They're on the way to bury this kid and then Christ raises them from the dead. Like, you know, I, I wish I knew what was being said at that time. You know, you'll see how it's kind of addressed here, right? Um, so because you know that back then they did same day burials. So I'm wondering if that kid, if they were probably saying, oh, misdiagnosed, kid wasn't really dead, this and that, right? The, the, the big deal about Lazarus was how long was Lazarus dead? 
four days, right? He was in the tomb. It smelled like he was, you know, like bound up. So that was like, that was a big deal, four days, right? So I think that was the one that kind of removed all doubt that when he was raising people from the dead, like he was raising people from the dead. Um, but I think that like whenever we come across this, like especially in the feast that we're in or the, the fast that we're in right now, preparing for the feast of the resurrection, right? Like this should be a big deal for us, right? Um, and, and to be honest, when you, when you start talking about the power of the resurrection, like that should be, I will tell you, if we have a Christ with no power of the resurrection, everything changes, right? Like everything changes. And St. Paul's one of the things he loves to write about. He writes about it in Philippians 3, Romans 8. Like this is a big deal. It is like the backbone of our faith, right? 1 Corinthians 15, 17, it says, if Christ is not risen, then your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. So like this resurrection, it's a, it's a big deal. It's something that we should all be super focused on right now. It's something that we should all be dialed into. So I want us to look at the story a little bit here because um, there's a lot to it. Um, and like I said, like I, I'll be the first one to, to confess that I, I usually read straight through this because I'm all about the woman with the issue of blood. Like, I love that miracle. So Jairus always gets the short end of the stick with me because that's always where I'm focused. So we'll read through it really quick. It's not even very many verses. We're going to start with um, Luke 8, 40 to 42, because that's the first part of it. So it was when Jesus returned that the multitude welcomed him, for they were waiting for him. And behold, there, became a man, there came a man named Jairus, and he was a ruler of the synagogue. And he fell down at Jesus' feet, and he begged him to come to his house, for he had only one daughter, about 12 years of old, and she was dying. Okay? Actually, I'm going to throw in the... Uh, um, but as he went, the multitude thronged him. Right? So now we know exactly how crowded it was. We know kind of what's going on. And then we're going to finish from verses 49 through 56. Because, you know, like, in the, we're, we're basically brushing right past women with issue of blood. It says, while he was still speaking, someone from the ruler uh, of the synagogue's house said to him, your daughter is dead. Do not trouble the teacher. And when Jesus heard it, he answered saying, do not be afraid, only believe, and she will be made well. And when she came into the house, he permitted no one to go in except uh, Peter, James, and John, and the father and the mother of the girl. Now all wept and mourned for her. But he said, do not weep. She is not dead, but sleeping. And they ridiculed him. Think of just like, just think about that part right there, right? And they ridiculed him, knowing that she was dead. But he put them all outside, took her by the hand, and called, saying, Little girl, arise. And the spirit returned, and she rose immediately. We're going to come back to that word, immediately. And he commanded that she be given something to eat. And her parents were astonished, because he charged them to tell no one what had happened. Uh, I'm going to say, that's, that's a top shelf miracle right there. Um, so let's start talking a little bit about Jairus and who Jairus was. So Jairus, he was a ruler of the synagogue, right? Um, this guy was a man of means, and, and he was well regarded. And, and what that really means is he was kind of the one who was in charge of the synagogue. Like he was, he was running things, right? Like he was involved in arranging the worship, choosing who was leading what, the teaches, and, and all of that stuff. Okay, and this man who was a very prominent Jewish leader, Jairus was having a bad day. Like this was a bad day for Jairus, right? Because how many daughters did he have? One. And what was her state? Dying. At this point, dying. Right? And think about that. Only daughter. Only daughter. It's not like he has 10 kids and he can, okay, you know, it's... <laughs> or he had four kids and he lost one, you know. But um, only daughter, right? Only daughter. And, and you think about how valuable was she to him, right? And you can tell because the fact that, you know, especially if you look at, at the time, his position, this was a well-respected Jewish leader. How is his behavior in front of Christ? He's a mess, right? He's a mess, Right. And, and the thing is, is, is he comes down and he basically just throws himself at the feet of Christ. What no respectable Jewish leader would do, let alone to this man who at this point, right, like a lot of the Jews couldn't even stand him. Right. So it's just you could you could just tell that he willing to do anything. And you get this picture of this dad. Right. Not a Jewish leader. 
right? And I'm telling you, there's a lot of redundancy when I started kind of digging into the story and I was comparing it to the centurion that we were talking about a couple of weeks ago, right? But, but not as a Jewish leader, the same way as the centurion did not come as a centurion, right? What did he come? He came as just a dad. Not just a dad, but a dad who was just terrified. Just terrified, in need, desperate, throws himself at the feet and starts just to beg. Was that above him? 100% it was above him. But for a parent, is anything above you? Like maybe as a, you know, a Jewish leader, it's above you, but as a dad, not above you. Like we covered a couple weeks ago, as a centurion, above you, maybe. As a dad, never above you. Right? I don't think there's anything we'd ever hold back. Right? And it got to the point where he's sitting there and he's begging. Why is he begging? Because he's watching his, his daughter, his only daughter, get worse and worse and worse and worse. Same thing as a centurion. Right? He's watching you know, that case get worse and, and sickness get worse and worse and worse unto death. Right? And it's this whole other thing right, where, where you hit this point where you basically say, I only have one more hope. There's only one more solution to this problem. Right? And it's Christ. And even to the point where I'm going to leave my sick child knowing that they could be dead by the time I get back in hopes that I'm going to go and I'm going to look for Christ. And the, and the similarity here between the centurion and the, and the Jewish leader is the fact that they knew where power was. And they said that I need to go to Christ because Christ has power, right? It wasn't enough to know that just Christ had power, right? But he also needed to get to the point where he realized as the father, you know, as the father of this little girl, that I have none. And I think that's something that a lot of us wrestle with a lot because a lot of the times we look at problems and we assess them. Right? Like, I can, I can handle this. We can do this. I can tap this resource. I can tap the resource. I have a plan. Right? But the reality of it is, is your plans, you can have the most eloquent plans in the world, the most best thought out plans in the world. But if you have no power, you have no power. And this, this you know, Jairus realized he had no power. In Mark 5.23, right? Because it's mentioned in, all, in three of the four Gospels, it says, you know, my little daughter lies at the point of death. Come lay your hands on her that she may be healed and that she will live. And I'm going to ask you guys, like you hear like the desperation in his voice, right? You hear the fact that he's out of options. So the question is, is have you been there? Have you been there in a point in your life where the problem is just so big, you're so exhausted, you have no idea, right? You're, you're desperate, you're exhausted, you're out of options and totally lost. And I think every single one of us at one point or another in our life, like we've been there. Well, we were just like, I, I just don't know where to go here, right? And then I'm going to tell you, okay, well, you know what? Let's look at his faith, all right? Imagine again that he hears Christ is coming. The multitudes are waiting for him, waiting to receive him, right? And he left his daughter who's on the brink of death, right? He leaves her to go out and to find Christ. But what, what else does he find? Like he's looking for Christ. What does he find? He finds a multitude, hundreds if not thousands of people, Right? And we know it because it says it in the story of, of the woman with the issue of blood. Like they are just all pressed in around Christ. And it says, I think the word is thronging against him. Right? And, and he's going. And he's not going to let that get in the way. He's not going to let that discourage him. And he's pushing through the crowd. Pushing, pushing, pushing. Nothing's going to stop him. Right? And, and he comes and he says to Christ, like, I, I need you to come put your hands on her. Like, I need you to come put your hands on her. And I want to compare his faith, right? Like, honestly, when you look at the stories that we've been covering, this is the weakest faith we've had so far, right? Because what do we talk about? We talked about the centurion. The centurion said, hey, I'll come. What did the centurion tell him? No, 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 you're good. Just, just speak it. Speak it, right? And then the, the next story with the woman with the issue of blood, did she even ask him anything? She says, no, 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 no. If I can just touch the hem of his garment, like, I don't need him to touch me. Right? Like, so we're seeing the faith here. It's like, we're just getting, we started up here and then we were like, okay, we're still good right here. And now we get to the Jairus and Jairus is like, dude, I need you to come put hands on her. Right? I, I, I just need you to come put hands on her. Right? He wanted Christ to touch her. But I'm going to tell you the beautiful thing about Christ is Christ did not compare his faith to the other people's faith. Right? He didn't just look at him and say, you didn't see that this lady just touched me and I didn't even have to do anything for it, right? He didn't compare her. The beautiful thing about Christ is Christ met him exactly where he was at. He's like, if this is where you are, then this is where I will meet you. 
And then after, after Christ is like leaving to go with him, right? And they're on their way to Jairus' house. That's when the woman kind of intercepts Christ, right? She kind of intercepts him, hits pause on his way to the house. Um, and the detour is a blessing, right? For the woman with the issue of blood, when she stopped him on the way to Jairus' house, that was a blessing, right? Who was it a blessing for? The woman. Was it a blessing for Jairus? No. Because what happened right after that? Right? And I, actually, before I jump into that, I'm going to tell you, right? Sometimes our timing and God's timing, it doesn't match, like at all. And, and I think a lot of the times we get very, very frustrated at the fact that we're saying, God, like, I need you now. Like, my situation is dire. Like, I don't think, like, I, I, if you don't do this now, I don't know what's going to be on the other side of this. But one thing that we always have to remember is that God is never early. We, we can all agree to that, right? Like, God's never early. But at the same page, we have to also acknowledge that God is never late. He's never been late. God's timing is always perfect. Because Jairus was in need and he was giving it all to Christ. And he walked in faith, right? He walked away from his daughter to say that I'm going to go get him because I know that this man is different and this man is a healer and this man could do something. And I will tell you, it is in our weakness that we see God show up again and again and again and again, right? It was in Jairus' weakness that he left his daughter, right, to go look for Christ because he knew that he was weak and there was something that, we couldn't, that he, couldn't, he couldn't fulfill. And I'm just going to put on there, isn't that why we all fast? Like, isn't it why we all fast? Just to know because we are weak, right? Like, like we are weak and when our, when our flesh is weak, our spirit thrives, and sometimes we're put in these situations because we need to see the spirit thrive inside of us, right? Because we acknowledge that our weakness and our dependence on God. And that is how we receive his power. I'm going to tell you, like, I don't know exactly how many weeks into the fast we are. I try to block it out of my head because it seems like it goes on forever. <laughs> so are we about halfway? Yeah. This is exactly halfway. All right, cool. So I'm going to tell you, that's even better, right? So we're, we're halfway through. How are you doing with that? How is your fast going? You know? I remember growing up, it was, it was probably even more than it is now, but I remember like, you know, this, this fast was almost like, like the peak of our spiritual life for the entire year, right? Because we had so much growth that we would experience in this fast, right? And it's like right now, I'm going to tell you, what if right now you are setting your peak, but it doesn't really look like a peak? Like, are we selling ourselves short? Because this could be your peak for the year, right? So how are we doing there? And maybe do we need to recalibrate a little bit about how we're fasting or what we're doing in our fast or how much we're praying, how much we're reading, how much time we're spending with God. I'll be the first one to confess to you that the diet thing, we've got that figured out, right? Like everything that you can have, <laughs> like you can have anything your heart desires now vegan, right? Like it's that easy. And maybe we're leaning into that a little bit too much. Right? Or maybe your fast is on point and on your dietary side, you've been strict with yourself and everything's going really well, but you are not doing the complimenting prayers and readings and, and those things. So assess yourself, especially if we're halfway through. Because God is willing to accompany us however deep we want to go. But he will not take us deeper than we are willing. And I fear that a lot of us, we're doing just enough. Just enough. So in the story, we get back, right? So Jairus, is, he was taking Christ back to his house. The woman interrupts. The woman receives healing. So good for her, right? But now Jairus is just like, you know, and I'll tell you, it's the funny thing, right? So like, you know, I was just with Emba Bulas for like last week, and there's something about leaving one meeting and going to another meeting. So I got, this house is waiting for me at a certain time. And then I'm trying to take him, say, you know, we got to go, we got to go, we got to go. And there's always people like, no, 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 no. I got to talk to the bishop, right? And I'm kind of looking at them. And I'm looking at my watch. And I'm looking at where I got to go. And I was like, like, like. There's, like, we can't do this right now, right? And I can imagine Jairus in the same position trying to take Christ and be like, hey, look, like, I get it. She's sick. I'll pray for you. You know, like, it's going to be okay, but like, we got we to go. We got to go. Like, my daughter's dying, right? And the whole time I can imagine Jairus is just praying it's not too late, right? Just praying it's not too late. And then something happens, right? You know, he finally, you know, the healing has happened. The, the woman's made whole and they start leaving. And in verse 849, someone comes and he tells them and says, your daughter is dead. 
do not trouble the teacher. And I am not sure which part of that is worse, right? Your daughter is dead or do not trouble the teacher. Like, don't bother him. Like, just don't bother him, right? And I'm going to tell you that this, this spoke to me a little bit about the way that we pray, right? And how many times when we stand in prayer with God do we just feel that we are just bugging him? Right? It could be the same situation. It could be something that it looks too broken. It looks too hard. It looks like it can't be fixed. Right? And a lot of the times I feel like even when I'm praying to God, I feel like God himself is like sick of my requests. Right? It's like I'm always praying about the same thing. But then I come across you know, Hebrews 4.16. And it says, Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of God that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Then I have to remember, and I says, like, that's... God is a loving father, like every single time, right? He is a loving father. And I'm going to tell you, have you ever had a time in your life where your kids come to you broken about something, just upset about something? I'm not talking about like, dad, I need another fruit snack, right? Like, no, I'm talking about like they are upset about something. And when that happens to us who are just earthly parents, do we just brush them off? Do we blow them off and tell them to get over it? I pray we don't, right? I pray we don't. But I'm talking about like the times where they really come to us with a heavy heart. Matthew 7, 11, it says, If you then, being evil, he's talking about us, we're evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good things to all those who ask? And I'm going to tell you, there's so many times where we just got it wrong. And we think that like God is frustrated with us. He's over us. He hates us. You know, and all of this other stuff. And it's like, that's not the character of God. So they come and they tell him, don't bother the teacher. And I'm going to tell you that if you start hearing voices like that in your head, like, you know, it says, don't bother God. God doesn't care, this and that. I'm going to tell you that that is never, ever coming from the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will never, ever tell you anything like that. That's from the enemy. Because God himself, he's never too busy. He's never too busy for you. He's never too busy to love you. He's ne never too busy to listen. He's never too busy to help. And if you are giving into the voice in your head that's telling you that he's too busy, he doesn't care, it's not important to him, that's from the enemy, and you have to kick it out. So Jairus hears at this point that his only child is dead. And, and when you think about that, that's, that's what the world told him. Right? The, the world told him, like the, the logical, you know, like when you look at it, like, yeah, his child was dead. Right? Like, there's no doubt about that. You can't argue that, right? But there's another voice. There's another voice that was introduced here. And it was the voice of Christ. Because you know what Christ told him? Right? So, so the world came and said, hey, this is too bad. Like, it's done. Don't even bother Christ. Like, it's over. It's written. Like, the situation's sad and it's going to stay sad. But then Christ, the other voice says, do not be afraid. Only believe. And she will be made well. And I just want to tell everybody here today, there's always going to be two voices. There's always going to be two voices, right? The question is, is whose voice will you listen to? Because Jairus had a decision there too. Whose voice was he going to listen to, right? Like the servant came and told him like, hey, your daughter's dead, right? Christ said, hey, just believe and she'll be made well. He could have been like, Yo, okay, I, I get it, God, but thank you. Or Christ, I get it, Christ, but like, no, it's already too late. Go ahead. There's a bunch of people waiting for you. You know, go find another lady with an issue of blood. They're, they obviously seem very important to you. Go, go, go heal that, right? But the problem is, is like, there's another voice. And I wonder how many of us settle for the earthly voice and we never listen to the voice of faith. Because Christ is always encouraging and supporting us and giving us the words of true life, right? So, and I will tell you, as much as we always hear these two voices, do you know which one you, that you're going to listen to? It's the one that you feed, feed into more, right? The more you pray, the more you fast, the more you attend liturgy, the more you're in the word of God, the more you spend time in prayer, all of this stuff, right, that, that voice gets stronger, right? But the more that you're living a, like, a, like a fleshly life, right, and concerned with all of those other things and you're neglecting all the spiritual things, well, then that voice is longer too because you're not going to have enough faith to listen to the first voice, right? But Christ refused to leave Jairus listening to the world and what it was telling him, right? And he made a point to tell him, the good voice, the good news, right? So they get into the house and something really strange happens in this story, right? And it's in, it's in chapter 851. 
It says when he comes to the house, he permitted no one to go in except Peter, James, and John, and the father and the mother of the girl. And you figure that's strange, right? Like that, that's weird, right? Why, why did he kick everybody out? Like it doesn't really say, but I'm going to tell you, when you look at the Bible, you have to remember that it all feeds in together. So a lot of these questions can be answered from like other areas of the Bible. And I'm going to tell you about this little trip. There's a trip he took to Nazareth, right? And one of the things it says about that trip, it's in Matthew 13, 58. It says, now he did not do many great works there because of their unbelief. So you're trying to tell me that Christ couldn't perform the miracle or wouldn't perform the miracles because people there had no faith? Right? In Mark 6, 5, it says, Now he could do no mighty work there except that he laid hands on a few sick people and healed them, and he marveled because of their unbelief. And I'm going to tell you, when Christ walked into this house, what type of miracle did he need? Was it a small miracle? Or was it a big miracle? Can we agree that this was a big miracle? Right? He had a dead little girl. He needed a mighty work. He needed faithfulness. So what did he do? He, he went in there and he kicked out all the unbelief. He said, for me to do what I need to do, I need to kick out all the unbelief. And I'm going to tell you that that spoke to me. Because I started thinking about that, right? There are many of us that we want God to do really big things in our life. We, we have situations in our life where we need God to show up in like a really, really big way. Right? It could be areas of hurt, areas of pain, just bad stuff. It could be sin that we've been in bondage to for God knows how long. Right? And we'll go up to him and we say, God, like, I need you. Like, this is a God-sized problem. This is not a little work. Right? But like, God, I need, like, I need like a big work. And God could be looking at us and he says, I can't do what I want to do because you've surrounded yourself with people that have no faith. You've surrounded yourself with people that are preventing me from working in your life. There's too much doubt surrounding you for me to do what I want to do. So it was, a, it, was, it was a little note for me. It says, hey, we need to be careful about who we surround ourselves with. There's a reason that Christ kicked everybody out of that house. And all of those people that we surround ourselves with, they determine our atmosphere. Do you think, how do you think that atmosphere was at that day at that time? He had a little girl who just passed, right? I guarantee you Jairus' house was a hot mess, right? Like, I'll tell you, it's beautiful. Have you ever been to, um, have you ever been to like a normal person's wake, right? Like, we'll even say like maybe like a Caucasian wake or something like that. When you, you get in there and everyone's sitting and they're kind of like, wow, this is really sad. We're going to miss them, you know, but hey, that's a celebration of life, right? Like, this is a great, great person. We, we love them and they did all these great things and, and I'll tell you, like, that stuff's so uplifting. I love going to those things, right? And then you go to an Egyptian wake, okay? At the Egyptian wake, it's a hot mess, right? If you don't have at least one lady pulling her hair, slapping her face, you know, or wailing, then nobody loved this person, right? Like, it is just, it's, it's really, really bad, right? So I imagine Jairus' house, just culturally, probably seemed a lot more of what we were used to. Okay, so you can imagine the morning session that was going on. And I'm going to tell you, it was a full-fledged morning session because in Matthew 9, 23, it says when they got there, the flute players had arrived and that the people were wailing. So you can imagine when you walked into this house what the tone of this house was. And I guarantee you, do you think that in that wailing session and in that morning session, do you think that that was an easy venue for them to find faith in? Do you think when Christ walked in, what do you think he felt? He felt defeat. He felt hopelessness. He felt mourning, right? What's even worse, and it says in the Gospel of Luke, it says, now all wept and warmed for her. But he said, do not weep. She is not dead, but sleeping. And they ridiculed him, knowing that she was dead. And I'm going to tell you that there's one thing to like not have faith and there's a whole other thing to openly ridicule him. And like that's where they were at on that day, to laugh at him, right? And I'll be honest with you, a lot of the times, you know, it's easy to read this story 2,000 years later because we know the end, right? 
but were they, were they off in saying that we know that she's dead? Like, they were, like, she was dead, right? Like, she was dead dead. You know, I have this memory, um, and it's going to be forever burned into my mind, but I remember um, I got a phone call that my uncle had passed. He passed at home, hospice, you know, and they said, come over. And I was probably like maybe like 19, 20 at the time. No, actually, no, I'd just gotten married, so I was probably, I think I was 25. And I remember I walk into the room, right, and I see him there. Looks different, without a doubt. If you've ever seen a dead body, it looks different, right? And I remember I went to go touch his hand. And it was the creepiest thing I've ever felt in the world because his hand was cold. Like cold, cold. Right? Um, and he had like just passed. It's not like I came like much later. Like I just got the phone call. They lived close. I, I just went. So when I look at this, it's like, look, did they know that she was dead? 100%. Like they knew that she was dead. Right? They thought that he didn't know what he was talking about. Right? How can his word be true? They know what they saw, and they know that that girl was dead, and they saw absolutely no hope. They said that it was over, right? And who was he to say otherwise? And honestly, I believe that that is the world that we live in now. Like, that is exactly where we all live. Like, God's word in itself is a joke. Because the way that everyone else views everything is completely different, right? Even, like, forget about, like, you know, God walking into a situation like this, right? Because this was, I get it, it was tough, right? Like, the girl was dead, and he's saying she's not. And I get how you can doubt that, right? But imagine even, like, the world that we're living in now, even just having a biblical perspective is a joke, right? Like, like think about it. Definition of marriage, that's a joke, right? Gender, that's a joke, right? Like, it's easy. It's like, you know, everybody ridicules. And everyone thinks, what does God know? Right? But Christ knew exactly what the situation was. He knew exactly who he was up against. He knew how this was going to end. Because God's word will never fail. And if he said something, I will bet you 100% of the time it's going to come true. Right? Because the problem is the people saw from the human perspective and they knew death. Right? This wasn't the first dead body that they saw. They, they, I'm, I promise you, they knew that there was no pulse. They knew the signs. And they knew that they were, she, that girl deserved to be buried by the end of the day. Well, who was right? Who was right? Well, it depends on, on the perspective because ultimately they were both kind of right a little bit, weren't they? Because she was dead, but then ultimately she was going to wake up. And, it, and it's crazy. And I will tell you the problem is it's like what, like we were talking about this when we started this, this series on miracles. It's like God has a purpose to every miracle, right? Like there's so much more than just the healing at hand. So a lot of the times we have to look at these stories and we say, okay, cool. Jairus' daughter was raised. Okay, but there's more to it. What was it? Right? And in this situation here, I love the fact that he took in St. Peter, St. James, and St. John by themselves in, his, in the room. And we also saw in the miracle of the water to wine, because in the miracle of the wine, who were the ones that saw it? It was his disciples. And at that point, when the disciples saw the miracles, they said, hey, we're going to follow him. Like this man has power. Right? And the same thing here, this was training for the disciples again. Right? He pulls them in, they're in training, and they needed to have faith beyond what made sense, beyond of what we saw in the room that day, in that house that day. You had a whole house of people wailing and miserable because this girl had died, and Christ needed to teach them that you cannot be deceived by what your eyes or what the world tells you because we're going to see some things that completely contradict even nature itself. Right? Because he needed to teach them that faith isn't logical. You needed faith to hear the voice of God when he says something, even when the situation doesn't even seem like it allows it. Because faith will bring things which look impossible straight into reality, which is what we see in this story. And in that moment, Jairus had faith. You know, he also saw the fact that everyone in the house was ridiculing. And he had a decision to make. Right? But I'm going to tell you, the fact that him and his wife were allowed into that room, what does it mean about them? They had the faith too. They believed. So now the times are all in the room. It's a big deal. It's a hard task to revive this little girl from the dead, right? We'll all agree that it's a huge deal, one of the biggest miracles that you can do, right? And like I said, verse 54, 55, it says he put them all out, got rid of all the chaos, got rid of all the unbelief. And I'm going to tell you that there's areas in our life right now that God 
I believe that he wants to work in, that he wants to do a work in, that he wants to give healing. But he's going to tell you that you're going to have to kick some people out. Like, I can't work in that area of your life as long as you let these people in. Right? So you're going to have to kick out the chaos on the unbelief. Right? And I love it because it says he took her by the hand saying, little girl arise. And the spirit returned and she rose immediately. Immediately. Mm-hmm. I want to go back to verse 50, where I want to say that when, when Jesus heard uh, whoever was telling Jairus that, that don't bother, uh, don't bother, uh, don't bother the teacher, dead. yeah, she's dead. I want to say that at this point, maybe Jairus' faith was lifted, it was going down. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, I, I have that in here. I think it's coming up. But the fact that it's a beautiful thing that because the second that he heard that your daughter is dead, I'm sure he was defeated and gave up. Right. But the problem is, it's not even like he looked at Christ at that point. Christ, basically, he stepped in. Right. He stepped in and he says, no, like, believe, just believe it'll be made. Because a lot of the times Christ will carry us when we ourselves can't stand. You know, and, and that's an important thing to, 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 to remember. And I'll be honest with you, and if you're honest with yourself, I believe that every single one of us has had a situation in our life where we didn't even see a solution, but God still provided it. Where we gave up, but God was faithful, right? And that's like exactly kind of like what's going on right now. So I, I hear the, boy, the, the kids getting out, so I'll try to rush through the rest, right? So he just, he, basically, he had so much power, three words was all it took. And she rose immediately. And I tell you, I think immediately is probably if we could just apply the word immediately into our lives, our entire spiritual lives would be different, right? Because when God tells us to do something, what do we do? We say, God, I'm going to get to that. God, I'm going to start on Monday. God, I, that sin cannot stay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start weaning myself off of it, right? Or I'm going to get rid of that one, but we're going to keep this one, right? But no, it was immediately. There was no 12 steps to resurrection you know it was just a one and done right God spoke to her the spirit returned and she rose immediately and many of us are missing that word immediately when God speaks to us when he gives us directions we just need to get up we need to rise up we need to receive the power and we need to do exactly what he's asking you to do because he will not tell you to do something that he has not given you the power to do so this whole thing of hey I'm gonna get there I'm gonna work on it like God is saying like, no, if I tell you to do something, I've granted you the power to walk in that immediately. <clears throat> so I pray that during this fast that we arise the same way that Tabitha did, right? And, and make no mistake about it, like our flesh is weak, but our spirit is stronger. And when he tells us to arise, don't ever think that we are doing it out of our, our mere power. Right? Because that is what the resurrection is all about. The resurrection is about his power inside of us. And that is how we arise. And then he commanded, said, give her something to eat. And the parents were astonished, but he charged them. And he said, don't tell anyone. Right? And it's funny because, like, you know, I'm saying, well, why, why the food? Like, what's up with the food, right? Like, I know we're Middle Eastern. We love food. So, of course, there's got to be a food part of the miracle. But I always wonder, like, why? Like, why the food, right? Well, the first thing I was thinking about was, like, you know, he wanted to ensure them that they knew what raised was flesh and blood. This wasn't a spirit. This wasn't anything else. Like, this was a full-blown resurrection. The same girl, same flesh, rose up again, and she was able to eat, right? The second thing I was thinking about is appetite is a sign of wellness. It's a sign of wellness, right? When we are sick, what's the first thing? You see people when they start losing a, a bunch of weight, right? You know, um, like it terrifies me when I see somebody who's like lost a ton of weight. The first thing I always ask them is, are you okay? Like, <laughs> are you sick? Are you like this and that? Because we know that when people get sick, they lose their appetite. But now she's well and she has an appetite. But I'm going to tell you that a lot of the times it's very easy to look at it with our physical appetite, right? We say like, I don't feel good. I have no appetite, right? It's a sign of a physical illness. But how many of us are walking around with no spiritual appetite? Because if we are walking around with no spiritual appetite, then there's a different sort of sickness that's actually going on, right? And what I love about this story is Christ shows up and it's never too late, right? In this story, 
Jairus had the faith to go out looking for Christ, but when he heard that the word was given that his daughter was dead, I'm sure it wasn't just, you know, I'm sure it wasn't just his daughter that died at that point. When the servant told him, like, hey, man, like, your daughter's dead. Don't bother the teacher. It just, it wasn't just the daughter that died. His faith died as well, to like Bessem's point. His faith died. And at that point, Christ told Jairus, I got this. It's not too late. Like, you might think it's too late, but I am telling you, it is not too late. And I think many of us are in situations right now that we think that Christ was too late. We think it's, it, it's just too late. It's too bad. It's too dead. The sin has been in my life for too long. I don't know what to do, right? And even though you think that, I'm going to tell you that God always has the final say. And if God is telling you, and I promise you he's telling you, it is not too late. So what are you fasting for? Like right now, halfway through the, the fast, what are you fasting for? I pray that you're applying something into this fast. Right, that we're praying for, for some sort of outcome on the other end. And I pray, to be honest with you, that we are preparing ourselves to celebrate the resurrection because if you're not praying for anything else, right, if, you're not, if you don't have anything personal going on right now or, or anything that you personally need to commit this fast to, the one thing that every single one of us should be committing this fast to is we need the power of the resurrection in our life. Our lives will look drastically different if we were walking around with the power of the resurrection in our life because that's what God does. God resurrects things. Don't settle for dead. In aspects of your life, don't settle for dead. Bring your fast. Bring your faith. List, lift up all of these things during this fast, even if it's currently dead. And invite Christ into the room. Kick out everybody else and expect resurrection. Amen? I'll stand up and pray. Does anybody have any questions, comments, or concerns? We're good? All right. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, name one God, amen. Dear Lord, we thank you for these uplifting words, Lord. We thank you that you are a God of resurrecting things. You take the broken, Lord, you make them whole. You take the things that are dead, and you bring them back to life, Lord. But what we need to bring to the table is we need to bring to the table faith, Lord. We need to, we need to approach you, Lord, and just to lay it all down at your feet, Lord, to bring you our desperation, our faith, our love, Lord. Sometimes we need to walk away from situations the same that you know, Jairus never would have ended up at your feet if he was not able to walk away from his daughter. So Lord, I ask that during the rest of this fast, Lord, that we can just, that we can mimic some of the things that we saw here in this story, Lord. And, and the fact that the same way that when Jairus was defeated, Lord, and he was probably ready just to go home and to hold his dead daughter's body and just admit defeat, Lord, I ask that you just step into that, Lord. And let your word be the prevailing word, Lord. And I ask that you speak to us, Lord. More importantly, I ask that we hear you, Lord. Because so many times we're just out of touch. So, Lord, I ask that uh, as, as we're cutting things out of our diet, Lord, I ask that you just teach us how to put things into it, Lord. Like the Bible, like prayer, like liturgy. Lord, I ask that we just increase all of these activities, Lord, because that is how we will hear you. And then ultimately, Lord, when we celebrate the Feast of the Resurrection, Lord, I ask to be... Just a special feast for us, Lord, and by that time that the power of the resurrection is living richly inside of us. And I ask this in the session of all our saints and martyrs. Here's what we pray, one voice saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Through Christ Jesus our Lord, for the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.